it's certainly it's good to see see you guys through your masks. Thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. Let's sing. I woke up this morning with my mind set on Jesus. You know, I woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind set set on the Lord. You know, I woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind set set on Jesus. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. You know we're teaching okay. and preaching with my mind, with my mind. Say, say it all, Jesus. You know we're teaching and preaching with our mind, with That's our so mind. Say, say it on the Lord. You know we're teaching and preaching with our and with our mind. Say, say it all, Jesus. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. You know I woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind. Say, say it on Jesus. You know I woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind. Say, say it on the Lord. You know I woke up this morning with my mind, with my mind. Say, Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Say hallelujah. Amen. Sound good. Amen. This is a sermon I've done before. You've heard it before. I've twisted it. Every now and then you'll see a good movie. You see a good flick and it's been uh, re remade or it's been uh, re-enhanced. And this is all that this, that this is. Um, but there are some new components to it. So, but let me get this to you. So on Monday nights we have, I have a Zoom Bible class and it's a series. And the series is entitled, The Great Will Adjust. And what we're going to do today is I'm gonna take some components of what we've covered on the Monday Zoom from the old sermon and give you something a little bit different. With me? Amen. You know what, Stanley? You miss amens. <laughs> so the lesson today, we're going to talk about how great people adjust to black swan events. And this is taken out of 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 1 through 7. We're going to go a little bit uh, beyond that, but... It's something that most of us are familiar with. This is not new information. I'm uh, playing it safe today, uh, knowing that today was going to be a very unique day in that we are having worship on the lawn. So, but stay in tune. We'll let you know what happens next week. And, you know, if we need to adjust times or locations, or if we're not going to do it, just stay informed. But let me give you the the what is the black swan phenomenon i was driving to work this was probably the first week in march pre shelter in place before everything really went down with COVID 19 i was driving to work i listened to talk radio so yeah, i'm a nerd my profession is a, is 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 a, a profession of nerds <laughs> and I like talk radio, and the topic of discussion was, was Corona, at the time, is Corona a black swan event? I had never heard this expression. Didn't know what it was. Matter of fact, the conversation was, was COVID-19 a black swan event or a gray rhino? And so I had to start taking notes. So there is a finance professor, former Wall Street trader who wrote a book called Fooled by Randomness, and it concerned financial crises. And his name is Nassim Nicholas Talib. He is the one that kind of penned this expression, black swan events. 
because he's looking at the money what corona and covid is doing to the money but the definition uh, so let me let me explain to you why he calls the black swan prior to the 17th century western civilization had never seen a black swan how many of you have seen how many of you have seen a black swan you seen a photo probably of a black swan but if you go back to the 17th century it was believed to be something that never existed and then all of a sudden someone on the western hemisphere saw a black swan it made sense and so the idea of the black swan was something that was kind of identified with the situation of impossibility initially they were like it's impossible for there to be a black swan black swan swans can only be white but then what happened is like oh after the fact it became clear so here's the definition of the black swan phenomenon there's three elements it's an event that comes as a surprise it's unpredictable unforeseeable that's the first definition it comes as a surprise unpredictable and unforeseeable second definition is this it has a major widespread effect or severe consequences you still with me let me give you an example COVID-19 came sudden it was a surprise unforeseen unpredictable widespread impact none of us saw this coming not one of us saw this coming matter of fact we were introduced to new terms once corona came on on the scene shelter in place when was the first time you heard of what shelter in place was the second and third week in march unpredictable you had no idea that you would be quarantined in your house five months later we never in our water streams thought about having to wear face masks matter of fact social distancing we were introduced to new terms you didn't know what social distancing was we didn't have that in america you go to the arco gas station you pump gas in your car you go inside the store you go to the cash register and someone's standing right behind you they're not six feet away <laughs> At, at Walmart no people are all up on you we didn't see this coming it was unpredictable it was unforeseen zoom you didn't know what zoom was you had no idea what zoom was live streaming and it, it, but it's the idea of how widespread of an impact this was we never thought in the church that we would not be worshiping here every Sunday Sunday school class, midweek class, we did not see this coming. COVID-19 is a black swan. Listen, you sit with me? George Floyd, black swan event. You didn't see that coming. No one, we, we watched videos of police, police brutality. We've, we've seen that. We've, this is nothing new, right? So the man has his knee on the man's neck and hand in his pocket, but we never knew that they'll be protesting all over the world and that they will paint the streets with Black Lives Matter. We we never saw that coming. That was a black swan event. Now, for those of you who are in the Monday night class, this is just review. We know this already. Now, now um, the third element of a black swan is this. It's not, not only is it a surprise event that has widespread consequences, it's often inappropriately rationalized after the fact with some, with some benefit of hindsight. Let me explain. September 11th was a black swan event. You woke up September 9-11. You woke up that morning prepared to go to work, school. Normal day. Normal, beautiful day at that. And then you're watching the news. 
watching the black swan unfold before your eyes, unpredictable. Didn't know that was going to happen. However, based upon the third element of a black swan with the idea of rationalizing something after the, the effect, you learn that later on, the CIA, the FBI had intel about the, about the terrorists, about them, them uh, training to get their uh, pilot licenses. And so it makes sense after the fact. Still with me? Listen, let me give you some Bible. Biblical uh, illustrations. Uh, Acts chapter 9, Saul's conversion. Black Swan. Saul, before he was um, became apostle, was was hell bent on going to, to kill Christians and arrest Christians, according to Acts chapter nine, and to, to drag them out of their homes. And he was on Damascus Road. And what happened? He, he got knocked off the donkey. You know, uh, uh, the, 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 he was interrupted. Black Swan event. He didn't see that coming. He didn't think he'd be blind for three days. No. And so you see, even in scripture, how it plays out with these types of events. If you're still with me, Acts chapter 2, the same thing. You know, the apostles or disciples are in the upper room. They're in, they're in that room in the house. And then all of a sudden, Acts chapter 2, the Bible says this. And suddenly, the sound of, of, of rushing wind whipped through the house. Remember that? Black Swanee bit. They had no idea that was going to happen. It was a surprise. I'm sharing all this because in life, we're going to have to figure it out how to adjust to surprise events, surprise setbacks, hardships, when things come at us from a blind side. And that's what 1 Samuel chapter 30 is all about. There's a lot of passages we could have selected, we could have chose from. However, I chose David because most of us are familiar with the life of David. His situation is somewhat chaotic. And he also has clear steps on how to adjust to crisis and trials when they come suddenly and unexpectedly. Still with me? Got your apps, got your, got your Bibles. 1 Samuel chapter 30. We'll read the first verse and then we'll just kind of step our way through it. We're not going to be here too long. The Bible says this. Now it happened. This, this is how it goes down. When David and his men came to Ziglag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and, the, and Ziglag. It was a surprise to them that the city was attacked, burned with fire, and had taken captive, the enemy taken captive, the women, these are the children, these are their, their fathers, grandfathers, their aunts and uncles, that's why the Bible says small and great, that's young and old. However, no one was killed, but they carried them away and went their way. Verse 3, so David and his men came to the city, and there it was burned with fire. Their wives, their sons, their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with them lifted their voices and wept until there was no more power to weep. We know how this story is. We know how it ends. But let me introduce you once again to David. David is this the same David who slew Goliath same David who's a psalmist he's a musician we read the Psalms we love the Psalms many of the Psalms are written by David he is remembered to be someone who's after God's own heart he is accomplished and he is in this text in many ways alone and sometimes in life when things happen to you that are unpredictable that are Un, say they're, they're not um, on your radar um, one of the hardest things to do is to go through it alone now the text says this it says that he's he's with his men he's got 600 men matter of fact and some of these men 
are his mighty men. And and let me say this, since I since I said it, Stanley, you need to have mighty people in your life. You need one or two individuals who are strong, who are powerful, who can pray with you, who can give you scripture, a strong wife, a strong husband, a strong mother, a father, whoever it is. But, so so these are his men, these are his homies, these are his homeboys, these are his homebodies. And they are away. So here's a setting. They are away on a business trip. Three days away. 50 miles away. And while they were away, an enemy came in, took the families, burned the city, took their stuff. What happens is this. It's the unthinkable. They are blindsided by a black swan. It's unfathomable, and the effects of it are widespread. And it is here in this lesson, we're going to learn just a few things, how great people adjust to sudden tragedy. And we're going to learn a few things from, from so, so, so I said earlier about David being alone. This is how it unfolds. The narrative is about David. It's not really about the men with David. However, David and the men all experience the same thing. However, they handle it totally different. The 600 men almost gives you like the picture of how most people will handle a problem, how the majority will handle the problem. David handles it with God on with God on his mind. And so we see David throughout his life, he is an individual who always had this idea that God is the one who makes the difference. God is the one who's going to get him through. God is the one who is, is his friend in times of trouble. His men go through the same thing he's going through, and yet they handle it different. So so there's two challenges. I don't have five. There's two challenges that David is going to have to adjust to. He's going to have to adjust to people and problems. Sometimes people are problems. And problems are always problems. But let's talk about it. So let's just break this down just a little bit here. So problems. Let's talk about problems. He has to adjust to problems. Great people have to do this. The city is attacked. At Ziglag, burned with fire. How would you feel if you came home right now and your stuff was just burned down? And then later you learn it's, oh, it's arson. It's not even like there's like a toaster on or, you know, it's it's someone who did something malicious to you. That's, that's, that's personal. But not only did they burn with fire, verse 2, the Bible says they have taken captive the women. This is a home invasion. This is, this is a crime scene. Verse 1 or 2 is a crime scene. It, the enemy comes in, does all this stuff, kids are gone, and, uh, the, the old people are abducted, and, and not just his family, all of the families with them. So let me pause for a second because we're talking about black swans. You're going to have to, in life, learn how to deal with problems. 2020, three months in, has been nothing but problems. Hard to imagine we welcomed 2020 in at the end of 2019. But this is the year of the black swan. 2020, think about it. What, what was our biggest problem three, three, four months ago? Toilet paper and hand sanitizer. Remember that? Seemed like ages ago, huh? that America was falling apart, fighting tooth and nail, hoarding and coveting toilet paper and hand sanitizer. It was a problem. Some of us learned this, this year, that our jobs were not essential. Now, some of you are in essential positions, but some positions were not essential and they were eliminated. And so I told you when I was 
my first my, my first live stream, I talked about how I was furloughed. It was awkward enough doing the live stream. I told Stanley, I said I was, I said I was nervous. I, I talking for the crowds all the time, basically for a living, you know. And I, I had a hard time with it. And got, but I was trying to be transparent. I say, well, you know, I got furloughed four four days out of the week. But then again, I couldn't complain being furloughed one day when my coworkers, a lot of them, were furloughed the entire time, one hundred percent. So I learned that my role, I work in IT, I'm the computer guy, so I'm the reason why you can work from home. But they still said, we don't need you five days a week. <laughs> and so then two weeks ago, we had layoffs. And so the same people that I've been working with for almost 15, 16, 17 years, they learned that their jobs have been eliminated. But this is like half the country. This is a black swan. No one who's worked on a job for 19, 20 years thinking that they're going to retire, that this is the last gig, would say, man, your benefits, all of this, you would not think that this would be, you know, um, but, but see, job loss is a problem. You, you know what else is a problem? Just speaking about 2013, uh, human contact, socializing. All y'all scattered out here. <laughs> Six feet away. We're, we're in clusters of families. You, Black Swamp. We didn't see this coming. Listen, this is how, this is how you still with me? Yeah. I'm just talking casually, comfortably. I'll get you out of here in about 15 minutes here. Listen, I miss hugs and handshakes. You know, we're doing this weird elbow thing and this... <laughs> we're doing now this is the church we, we the, the ch I've been in the church all my life I turned 50 I turned 50 sheltered in place like some of you graduated sh sheltered in place going to school sheltered in place I've never seen anything that kept us from worshiping like like it came from the top saying you cannot assemble and, and the church comply with that. This is this is this is a new experience. This is this it's a, it's a it's a black swan. Now, let me just let me just say this while I'm here. I miss the movies. I miss eating inside restaurants. Can can we just talk? Can we just talk? This is a problem, and we are adjusting every day with this thing. I miss vacation. Don't you miss vacation? Yeah. We had we had planned on going on a cruise this year. The last place you want to be right now <laughs> is a cruise. In the text, the enemy came in and attacked everybody. It did not discriminate. Corona does not discriminate. Age, gender, and we, are, we have to adjust. The second thing David had to adjust to in the text was not only did he have to adjust to this problem with the enemy, he had to also deal with people who are in the crisis as well. His own men. If you drop down in the text like verse number six, here's what scripture says. It says, and say, now David was greatly distressed. Rightly so. His wives. He had more than one wife. He had children. And all these men and their families spoke of stoning him because the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughter. These same men who vowed to die for David are now speaking about stoning him. What they were going through was not easy. But in this, I said David was alone. He lost his support system. And now he's dealing with problems with people 
sometimes in life the problems is not the job it's not your car it's the people around you when things were good they were there when things start to unravel they leave or they turn on you or they walk away and there you are alone wrestling with your own grief and your own loss but here it is we learn from David that you really can never depend on people the same way you can depend on God because when all see, all others have left moved away they're still God and it is here that we learn, say, great people adjust to problems and people in life. The question is raised today, how do you handle what, can, what you cannot handle? How can you handle what you cannot handle? You adjust. And there are three things David does to adjust to the problems and the people that are around them. We're going to go, this, go through this real quick. The first thing is, David is prayerful. He's prayerful. Verse number six says this. It said that he strengthened himself in the Lord. He didn't strengthen himself at the gym. He strengthened himself in the Lord. Now, still with me? Kind of. This is what I do on Monday nights. We look at a text. We were studying Job for a while. And I said, you have to make observations in the text about what they don't do. You can see what they're doing, but you have to think about what, what didn't they do. And like Job with David, we see this. David, his life is falling apart, is unraveling. But first thing, he doesn't hurt himself. You know, what's, the, what's that saying? People who hurt, hurt others. But people who hurt also hurt themselves. And they do a lot of, say, they may do self-destructive things because they are lacking something or they're hurting in some kind of a way and they're trying to cope with it. And so they try to deal or cope with it by doing things that potentially are harmful. Whether that's, listen, that could be smoking a blunt. <laughs> Get, getting drunk, you know, uh, Sexing in a way, you know, uh, shopping in a way, you know, they, we do all kinds of things. We all do these things when, when we are trying to cope and deal with, you know, I'm not just talking about cutting oneself. He doesn't do that. David does not go, David does not hurt other people either. David, David does not say, well, y'all, y'all trying to stone me. Well, I'm just going to say a little prayer here. And have God fight you like he fought Goliath on my behalf. And he doesn't do that to his own men. He doesn't go around slapping his men around. How dare you turn on me? He doesn't whip out a slingshot. Just, <laughs> he doesn't do any of that. What David does do is this. He strengthens himself in the Lord. He's prayerful. He handled his crisis by taking it to God. It is essential that the child of God learns how to live in conversation with the Lord. I asked the Monday night group this. I said, we, we have to learn how to live in conversation with God. God's a great communicator. God likes to talk. He wants you to pray. He wants you to confess your faults. He wants to hear your voice. So do you find yourself, say, during the day, just talking to God. Conversationally. Expressing yourself conversationally with the Lord. That's what Moses, that's, that's why the Bible talked about how Moses was a friend of God. God didn't talk to Moses through dreams and visions. Talk to him like a friend. Talk to God like a friend. David is in a jam. He is in a pickle. Things are falling apart. Wives gone, children gone, papa gone, nana gone. And he's prayerful. Listen, the Bible says this. <clears throat> he said to Abiathar, the priest. Abiathar is 
He's the guy you call when you need someone to, to, to pray for you, to sit with you, to hold your hand. He is the priest. He, he, he wears what's called the ephod. And the ephod is, is a priestly garment. And he says, please bring me the ephod. Bring me my cell phone. I need to talk to the Lord and consult with the Lord about my predicament. This is a black swan. I don't know what to do next. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, he's prayerful, shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? He wants to know, should I go after the enemy? Should I stay or should I go? That's what he's saying. But note, David does not ask for details. Sometimes when things crumble in your life, you don't get the details. You don't get the small print. You don't, you don't get the forecast that is coming, that's going to happen. It, it, and sometimes in life, you don't get the answers you want. You don't get a do-over. But you don't need an answer as much as you need God. And that's the thing we learn from David in the first thing. He's prayerful. The second thing, you've heard me say this before. He's proactive. He's proactive. Listen, the Bible said this. The Lord said to him, pursue. He says, go. For you shall surely overtake them without fail, recover all. God is telling him to go and make a move. Be proactive. Now, now proactive by definition is this. It is when you make things happen. That's the definition of proactive. Instead of waiting for them, to happen to you, you make it happen. So I'm studying this, and here's, here's the clarity that I get. The Holy Spirit gives it, gives it to me. God will deliver you from some things, but not all things. God will deliver you from some things, not all things, unless you make the first move. Listen, what did Philippians say? Philippians writer, chapter 2, verse 22. You, you work out your own salvation. Because the philosophy or the theology is this, and a lot of, a lot of the, the, the denominational groups teach it, that you say by grace, you can't work your way in, there's nothing that you can do to get into heaven. However, faith without works. Faith, faith has fruit. We learn this all in the New Testament that there are certain actions that Jesus required of people to make a move, to, to listen, to help themselves. Jesus said in Luke 9, he said, if any man desires to come after me, now note he didn't say that just, if you just have a desire, you get, you get instant, instant access into heaven. He said, if anyone desires come after me, they must deny themselves. Take up the cross, take up their cross, and follow. And so there are some things you have to be proactive in your life in order to improve your situation, to get yourself out of a predicament. In the text, you see with me? Just got one more point. Let me finish this one up. Listen, the enemy came in, Took his stuff, took his family. David's prayer is not, Lord, make the enemy bring my stuff back. That's a wasted prayer. Because the enemy is not going to just bring his stuff back. I don't care how hard you pray on that. If someone stole your joy, stole your peace, stole your stuff, you, they're not bringing it back. They stole it. Have you ever had something of great value stolen? I, you know, the last time I preached this, this lesson, I talked I talk about the car. You get your car stolen, I'm telling Ollie, guess what? You get, your, get, get your car stolen, they're not bringing that back. They're going to they smoke in your car. <laughs> your car going to smell like weed. They're going to be chip bags. 
cookie wrappers. You go, you'll see socks in your car. They're not bringing it back. You gotta go get it. You got to call the police, fill out a report, call your insurance, put out an APB to get your stuff back. It's not coming back. The enemy does not bring your stuff back. So in life, there are some things you will have to fight for. You got to be proactive in it. You will have to listen, fight for peace in your own home. And you can't wait for your wife to initiate that. Can't wait for your sister, your brothers to initiate that, mom and dad to initiate that. You might have to be proactive to bring peace in your situation. He's prayerful, but he's also proactive. He's, he's trying to correct the mistake. God said, go, go get him. Here's the last point. You got to be persistent. The bee flying. Got to be proactive. You can't let that bee sting you. <laughs> last point, last point. Um, persistent. Verse 47, the Bible says this. Then David attacked them from twilight until the evening. He pursued them, went after them, got, got to the enemy. And for a 24-hour span, he is engaged with the enemy. And then what happens is this, says, uh, not, not a man of them escaped except 400 young men who rode on camels and fled. Verse 18, David recovered what? All that the enemy had carried away. David rescued two wives. He had two wives. And nothing of theirs was lacking. All of the men who were with him got the great and small back, got their sons and daughter back, the spoil, or anything which they had taken from them, David recovered all because David was persistent. We're leaving on this note here. This year has been a black swan event. Some of us, our jobs were taken. If not your job, you know somebody who, whose job was. You're going to have to be persistent. You can't just call unemployment one time. You might not get through. If you might not get through. Just an example. You may have to keep calling them, being persistent, reaching out to other people, and not only that, you're going to have to be persistent to get a new job. You can't just give up after one battle, after one fight, whatever the situation is for your situation, for what you're going through. David recovered all that was taken. And so we have to fight for our marriages, fight for our friendships. We have to fight for the church. We're trying to figure this thing out because they're talking about churches all across the country closing. Might not come back. Might not survive this. And so we're trying to figure out, do we worship in our cars? Is there another way in which we can do this? On the Sunday morning, churches have split over the principle of forsaking the assembly. Some have not returned because they did not see the five steps five acts of worship online and we're going to have to be persistent and proactive to restore what God has put in place back in AD 33 wow. this is power we are in a powerful time right now in every age it is our responsibility to restore New Testament teaching the gospel of Jesus and to make sure this thing is still existing when we are dead and gone Let's end with this. The black swan, the event itself depends on the observation of the, the perspective of the observer, rephrase it that way, to the turkey. Thanksgiving day is a black swan event. Turkey did not see that coming. From his vantage point, Farmer John has been a good man, he's fed him, got him fat, he's looking good, but it's not a black swan event for the butcher. All depends on the perspective and the angle of the observer. Pearl Harbor 
was a surprise to the Americans. We didn't see it coming. 